one of the things that you might learn when you go to a youth camp is that about after the second or third day, odors start wafting. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Boys on the basketball court, kids on the volleyball court. You know, the girls always had wet hair when it was time to do whatever we needed to do after the sporting events. The only reason the guys had wet hair was because they were in the lake. Um, and you know, you know when you need washed, when you can smell yourself. Right? Isn't that true? Guys, have you ever had one of those days when you just went after it, after it, after it, and you think, man, whose armpits are following me around? What is that smell? Oh, it's me. And as we think about it, sometimes we get spiritually stinky. Sometimes we don't go to Christ to be washed, to be cleansed like we ought to on a regular basis. And today, as we talk about the sermon series, Priesthood of the Believer, we're going to talk about being washed and worthy. Because the only way that we're worthy to be in the presence of God and the only way we're worthy to be able to be used by God is to be washed by the blood of Christ. And you know, that's one of the things that we tried to explain to kids this week. It seems like a foreign concept in our world today that blood would make you clean. Uh, Because we all know that when you have blood on you, you use water to wash the blood off and you're clean. But we're not talking about physical. We're talking about spiritually. And so in the Old Testament, God had a plan. In the New Testament, God had a plan. And we spent a whole week talking to the kids about what sacrifice looks like and why God did what he did in the Old Testament and what happens to us in the New Testament. And, you know, I want to think that we know, but I also don't ever assume that everybody knows what the sacrifice of Jesus really is all about and how that affects us. Um, You know, sometimes we grow up where if you've been in church all your life, everybody just assumes you're a believer. Or if you went and shook the preacher's hand, you might be a believer. Or, you know, we talked to the kids about the fact that we weren't there to get notches on our Bibles for coming back and saying, well, we had a successful camp. 25 kids gave their lives to Jesus. How do we know that? We have them for a week. We have them for a week. Some of them grow up in Christian homes. Some of them don't grow up in Christian homes. Some of them will do whatever you manipulate them to do just to make you feel better about yourself. Right? And there have been a lot of people in the history of the United States who call themselves Christians, who prayed a prayer with somebody at some point in their life, but nothing changed. Nothing changed. And that's not salvation. That is not salvation. That is not washed by the blood of Christ. A lot of people come to Christ because they're feeling really sorry for themselves because they've got some really awful things going on in their lives and they don't want God's salvation. They just want God to take the pressure away. God, make it better. Okay, so it gets better. What often happens to those people? It's like a magnet. It sucks them right back to wherever they were before. So was that salvation? I don't think it is. The Bible tells me that those who are washed by the blood of Christ are changed. Changed, maybe not on the outside, but changed on the inside to the place where they truly want to serve God. They truly want to live for God. And, you know, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God determined the method, the mode, and the ministers for acceptable worship. Method, mode, and ministers. Now, if you were to talk about method and mode of ministry. There are some churches that are high church. Have you ever been to high church church where they've got the giant pipe organ up in the front of the church and they've got all the stained glass windows and everything? Terry was going through some pictures of her mom's and man, I'm telling you, some of the places in Europe they went to visit there are just, everything's gold inside these churches, these elaborate altars, and they've got statues, and they've got this, and they've got that, and it's all gold and trimmed in gold. And do you know what? Nobody goes to church there anymore. How about that? No, it's just a museum now. And do you know in the United States of America, we have museums and we have mausoleums that call themselves churches, don't we? It's more than just having a building 
You know, when the first church met, they didn't meet in the building. They met wherever they could meet. They met in people's houses. They met out with Jesus in the, in the fields and places like that. And so as we look at what's going on, different modes and methods change. Don't they? Methods change. Um, nobody wants to hear revivalistic preaching anymore. Everybody wants to hear nice, soft, cushy, lovey-dovey, marshmallow, squishy sermon. Except you guys. Or you'd be somewhere else, right? Because that doesn't happen here. There are times when we need to know that we can just rest in God's arms and be loved by Him and be cared for by Him. We need that, don't we? Those are the times of refreshing when we come together to do that. And we're going to do that in a couple weeks on a Sunday night, on the last Sunday night of the month. We're going to have another Sunday night worship service, a special worship service where we come together to focus on worshiping God, okay? I'm inviting you now ahead of time so you know about it. Chance to come out and just bring whatever you got to God and give it to him. But Pastor Ron, I always give stuff to God, but, 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 but I pick it back up when I walk away, don't we? And we carry it again like it's ours. Well, ministers in the Old Testament, the priests and the high priests and the Levites were the ones who took care of all the worship of God. And God installed them. God picked them. He chose them. He was the one who decided. Before Aaron and his sons were installed as priests, though, they were ceremonially cleansed in front of God's people, Israel. Now, we talked about the fact last week that Moses' brother Aaron was the first high priest and his two sons were also priests. But they came from a tribe that was a disreputable tribe, all four of them did, and that was the tribe of Levi, Levi because they were people who were killers and murderers, and God said, I'm not okay with that. But God found a way to redeem them by making them the priests, and he promised them they would never have a place in the promised land as one of the tribes, but God would always take care of them because they were the ones who were going to go to worship for God take people's offerings, offer those sacrifices, and then they would be fed and, and paid out of those offerings. So let's look at an Old Testament. We don't go way back this deep very much into a book that we don't ever hardly go to, Leviticus. Leviticus. Now, if we had a Bible drill today and you hadn't already had a chance to look up Leviticus, I wonder what percentage of us would even know where Leviticus was. Have you ever seen a Bible drill? where the kids stand at attention and they present their Bible and somebody gives them the name of a chapter that they've already studied and they know what it is or they have to find a book in the Bible and then they have to tell you what the book is before and the book after that book. Have you ever seen that happen before? What would happen if we just stood everybody up in here this morning at Cumberland Community Church and said, get your Bible out? First, might not be somebody that even has a Bible, Okay. Somebody would say, but mine's on here. It's on here. It's on this little machine that I carry around in my pocket. Well, it's fine. That's nice. You can push a couple buttons and find it. But can you find it in here? You see, here. What happens if all the electronic stuff goes bad and goes away and you don't have that? Can you still find stuff in God's Word and read it? Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, third book of the Bible, chapter 8. We're going to look at the first six verses, and then we're going to look at a few after that. And we're going to talk about how God chose and what he did to present these men to himself so that they were worthy to serve him. All right, look at Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron and his sons, along with their sacred garments, the anointing oil, the bull for the sin offering, Two rams and a basket of bread made without yeast, and call the entire community of Israel together at the entrance of the tabernacle. So Moses followed the Lord's instructions, and the whole community assembled at the tabernacle entrance. Moses announced to them, this is what the Lord has commanded us to do. Then he presented Aaron and his sons, and he washed them with water. Okay? He washed them with water. Symbolic. Um, this is an indication that service to God must be clean and pure. Do you hear that? Service to God must be clean and pure. There are people out there on TV and there are people in other places who are quote-unquote serving God for ulterior motives, and that's to get a new helicopter, a new airplane, a bigger house. Correct? If It's like the old Ponzi schemes and the old um, Amway, Amway scheme. You do this. I get more money, but then we'll drag you along and you get a little more money too. 
is the gospel of Jesus Christ about money? Is serving God all about things? No. Jesus said what? If you love the world love the, more than you love me, you're not mine. And there are too many people who love God less than what they love in their bank account or what's at their house or what they drive. So as we look at this, this ceremonial washing uh, shows that in service to God, we have to be clean and pure. Those guys did. The New Testament police, uh, b- believer priest is symbolically washed in the blood of Jesus shed at Calvary. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 12 real quick. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 12. This is what it says. Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He's entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Do you hear that? Jesus cleanses us by his blood, and he makes us holy, and his sacrifice is a once-for-all sacrifice. By this time, they hadn't even started the practice of sacrificing when Aaron and his sons are being installed as priests. God gives them, if you read all the book of Numbers and all of Leviticus, God gives them a prescription. I mean, there is an offering for every sin, a, a different offering for every sin. And here's the amazing thing. Whatever they sacrificed only covered that sin. How many sacrifices a day would we have to make to cover just our own sin? Huh? How many? Aren't you glad Jesus' blood covers all our sin? The Bible says... If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you hear that? When you confess your sin to Christ, he wipes the slate clean. Not yet, you don't have to do it for everything, every time, all the time. But we should keep a short order with God. We don't have to make sacrifices because Jesus is the sacrifice. And we're renewed by God's word. We're cleansed by God's word also. Psalm 119.9 says, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Young people in the room. Okay, young people in the room. How can a young person stay pure? Parents who are raising young people in the room. How can a young person stay pure? How? By obeying the word of God. How can you obey it if you don't know what it is, right? So there's two things. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Obedience comes by hearing the Word of God. Do you hear that? So we need God's Word to cleanse us, to make us pure, because it points out all the things in our lives that need to be changed. John 17, 17 says, as Jesus is praying for his disciples right before he's ready to go and be hung on the cross... He's praying for his disciples, and this is what he asks, and this is for us too. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Do you hear that? In our world today, there is truth. It's not your truth or my truth. It's God's truth. Does anybody believe that? God's truth is the only truth there is. There's no other truth better than his And everybody wants their own truth in the world today. But no, if we're going to stay pure, we have to live by God's truth. And then you can look up Titus 3, 5, which says the Holy Spirit also cleanses us and helps us to be everything that God wants us to be. Well, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 8. We're going to read verses 7 through 9 and then verse 13. This is what it says. He put the official tunic on Aaron and tied the sash around his waist He dressed him in the robe, placed the ephod on him, attached the ephod securely with its decorative sash. Then Moses placed the chest piece on Aaron and put the Urim and Thummim inside of it. He placed the turban on Aaron's head and attached the gold medallion, the badge of holiness, to the front of the turban, just as the Lord had commanded him. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, making them holy. 
He sprinkled oil on the altar seven times, anointing it and all its utensils, as well as all the wash basin, its stand, making them holy. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head, anointing him and making him holy for his work. Next, Moses presented Aaron's sons. He clothed them in their tunics, tied their sashes around them, put their special head coverings on them, just as the Lord had commanded them. Now, we don't know exactly what all that looked like, okay? We have an idea what a turban is, don't we? People still wear turbans in the world today. We have an idea what a tunic is. If you've ever seen anything that is medieval, like a movie with knights or during the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. They wore a long shirt with long sleeves and the shirt came clear down to their knees. That's a tunic. Then they wore a robe over top of that. Then they had to tie it all together with the belt, right? So we know what those kind of pieces of clothing look like. And for a long time in the world, um, we're looking at exclusive ceremonial dress. God was setting them aside from the people. They weren't even going to dress like the people. Every day, they had to put those clothes on. Every day. Because they served God how many days a year? Every day. That was their job. And do you know, we're supposed to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ every day, aren't we? Because how many days of the year are we supposed to serve Christ? Every day. We serve Christ every day. Because if you remember, Peter tells us that we are a royal priesthood a people of God's own choosing. And that's who we are. Aaron and his two sons were chosen by God to lead the sacrificial worship for Israel every time they quit traveling. Now, they didn't stay in one spot. If you'll remember, for 40 years, what'd they do? They wandered around all through the wilderness, didn't they? Why? Because they didn't do what God wanted. And every time God stopped because there was a pillar of a cloud and a pillar of fire that followed them day and night. And, and when God stopped, they set the tabernacle up. They went to worship in God. And as we think about it, man, can you imagine? Can you just imagine what it would have been like in that spot in the desert where they're slaughtering all these animals? I mean, I used to work in a butcher shop. I know how it smells. And I know how it's icky, sticky, and gooey. And I know that it's not for the weak of heart. Or the week of stomach. You know, um, people used to ask my dad, he said, what's the matter, you got a weak stomach? He said, nope, I can throw it just as far as anybody can. Can you imagine what it must have looked like? What it must have smelled like? With all this bloodletting and all these animals being sacrificed? Can you imagine? Aren't you glad that Jesus is our sacrifice? Aren't you glad that he's the one who made it so that we don't have to do that anymore? And there are a lot of people who are hoping that one day the is going to be rebuilt so the Jews can restart the sacrificial service. No, they don't need that. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. He is the sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice. Aaron received seven items as a high priest. He got a tunic, a sash or girdle, a robe, an ephod, its sash, a chest piece, and a turban. And you know, for most High church, churches, if you've ever been to the Catholic church, the Episcopal church, the Lutheran church, or any of those kind of churches, all their priests wear what we call, what they call vestments or special clothing, right? Have you ever seen that? I mean, I was going to wear mine today. I have some over in the, in the closet that I was going to put on and walk in here this morning, but I'm waiting by freaking out on me, right? I got the big, long black robe. I don't know where I got it, but somebody gave me one. The only thing I don't have is all those pretty little neck scarfs they put around them that hang down on both sides with big pretty crosses and all that kind of stuff on it. Do you know what? That don't make you any holier than me standing here in my blue jeans and my loafers and my vest. Anybody believe that? I don't need to be set apart from someone else. I'm just like you. I struggle with what you struggle with. I deal with what you deal with. I have to go to God for forgiveness every day of my life. I will never wear that stuff. Number one, it's too hot. And if anybody's ever been around me after I've been up here preaching on a Sunday morning, if I didn't have long sleeves on, there'd be a puddle right here beside me dripping off my elbows, right? I don't need that stuff. But at that point in time, God was establishing what it looked like to worship him, okay? These people were the only ones who were allowed in the tabernacle to do the worship. 
Anybody else that got caught in there were a few that did. If you want to read your Old Testament, there are a few that did. And God, <laughs> they tried to burn strange incense and God just turned the fire around and it scorched them till there was nothing left of them. Okay? You don't approach God if you're unclean or impure in the Old Testament. You don't. And the high priest could only go into the Holy of Holies one time a year. And when he went into the Holy of Holies, they put an actual extra garment on him that had bells hanging all over it and they tied a rope around his ankle and as long as the bells were making noise while he was in the holy of holies that meant there was no sin in that man's life but if the bells quit ringing for a long time guess what it was time to do pull the rope because there must have been sin in his life and God struck him down right in his presence. And that's an amazing thing. We have Jesus as our mediator to the Father. Remember what we said? He stands in front of God every day, making intercession for us, praying for us, praying for us, praying for us. And they didn't have that. And if you went into God's presence unclean and unholy, you died. Think about that. Okay? How many of you would like to have been a priest in the old days, the high priest? Anybody? Anybody believe you could walk in there before God with no sin in your life? Think about that for a minute. I asked kids up there at camp, I said, anybody not sin at all ever? And one boy raised his hand up and I said, you just did. You just did, dude, right there, you did. You sinned right there. Aaron's sons didn't get the same thing that Aaron got. They got tunics. They got sashes, girdles, robes, and turbans. They didn't get this special thing called an ephod. And if you read the story, it has different colored stones in it, and it represents different tribes, and it represents what God's doing, and only the high priest wore that. They got everything else except a couple things that they didn't get the gold badge of holiness either. Would, I, would you like to have a gold badge of holiness? Hmm? Anybody want a gold badge of holiness? I don't. I just want my name written in the book. I just want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. Because the Bible says that whatever rewards God gives us, we're just going to turn around and lay them right back at his feet. You know, what we do here, we only do because God's enabling us to do it and because we're willing to do what God wants. And I believe in heaven that there's got to be a giant room full of all the un gifted blessings, all the ungifted rewards, because people said no to God, because people said, God, send someone else, because people said, God, I'm too busy, because people said, God, I can't do that, because people said, God, I'm not going to do that. Hmm. Think about that with me for just a second. The priest's coat, this coat that he puts on, this robe that he puts on represents righteousness, Okay, it represents righteousness. If you remember the story in Genesis chapter 3, what happened? Adam and Eve sinned, and the evidence of their sin was their eyes were open to their nakedness, right? And God killed the first thing that was ever killed on the earth when he sacrificed the animals that he killed to put those on Adam and Eve for clothing, Okay? God did not walk up to a deer or a bear or whatever and say, would you unzip your fur and take it off? You can run around naked. I can't have them running around naked. I need them to put on your clothes so they can zip them up and be covered. Right? God doesn't do that. God had to kill. God had to sacrifice animals. He took life. He took life, lives to cover Adam and Eve. We don't know what their clothes look like. We don't, but we know it covered them, okay? And so as we think about that, when we come into God, we need to put on his righteousness, don't we? We need to be covered in the righteousness of Christ. God made provision for those who worship him to be acceptable in his presence. The fig leaves didn't cover the unrighteousness of Adam and Eve. Man's own righteousness is as filthy rags before righteous God. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousness, all the good things we can produce, all the good things that we can gin up on our own are as filthy rags where God's concerned. Filthy rags, okay? Think about that. We think, wow, I really did something great. God says, that's just filthy rag. 
I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. Well, you know, I is a problem, isn't it? It's the middle letter in pride. I. I. It's only the righteousness of Christ that covers our unrighteousness and makes us righteous. So as we look at this, we're, we are to put on the righteousness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. Christ made us right with God. So he made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Think about that. We're made right with God through Jesus Christ who makes us right and pure and holy, free from sin. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just stay right there? How many of you have ever been someplace and you just said, I just want to stay here forever? Huh? That's where I want to stay right there. But I know that there are going to be days in my life when I'm not going to do what God wants. And that's not an excuse, but it's a reality, isn't it? And I know there are times when God's going to call on me to do something, and I'm going to give him an excuse why I can't. But I need to be righteous and holy and pure, and that's why I need to come back to Christ, and that's why I need to every day confess my sins to God, and every day I need to come before him and ask that Jesus' sacrifice would cover my sins again. Do you hear that? I don't have to go all the way back to zero. I don't have to go all the way back to being unsaved. There are some people out there that believe that once you give your life to Christ, you can lose your salvation. I say that Jesus said this, of those the Father gives me, I'll not lose one, but I'll raise them all on the last day. He's the one who holds my salvation in his hand. It's not mine to give up. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you know somebody who said they were saved at some point, now they're living like God doesn't even exist, they either were never saved before or they're just backslidden so far that they've forgotten who God is. But here's the deal. If they never straighten that out with God before they die, that's when the true answer falls to whether they were saved or whether they weren't saved. And people say, well, saved from what? You know, we talk about washed in the blood, saved, saved, saved. Saved from what? Saved from the wages of sin, which is death. Saved to the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Saved like you can't do it yourself. Like when you're drowning out there in the water and you're going down for the third time and it takes the person who comes swimming out there, gets behind you, puts their hand up under you and starts swimming backwards and is strong enough to swim with you and them to get you back to shore. Does that make sense to everybody? How many of you are strong enough swimmers to do that? See, we can't save anybody, can we? Only Jesus Christ can save us. And it's by his sacrifice. And he makes us, he doesn't only just save us, he changes our eternal trajectory. He makes us holy, he makes us pure, and we ought to live in that. Shouldn't we? Did you hear the last verse of that song, The Wonderful Cross? Demands, right? God demands that we are holy. He doesn't just suggest that we are holy. And we know what it looks like when God's not the one who picks out the priest. What happened in the New Testament when Jesus came on the scene and they started listening to what he had to say and they got all in a tither about the fact that Jesus was teaching stuff that was really godly, but they didn't want it because they were about to lose their power and lose control of the people. What did the high priest do? He met with all the other priestly people and said we got to get rid of this guy he's making us look bad now why don't we do that in our world today how many false teachers are out there in the world today how many false teachers are out there just turn the tv on and listen to them they don't talk about what the bible says unless they're twisting it to make it say what they want it to say They don't read God's word. They don't talk about the priesthood of the believer. They don't talk about that kind of stuff. Romans 13, 14, it's not in your notes, says, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? Clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans 13, 14. And if we're going to live for Christ, we've got to take off our old sin nature and we've got to put on Christ, don't we? If we're going to be priests of Christ, just like Moses took the robe and he put it on Aaron, and that was a symbol of righteousness before God, we take off our old dirty self and we put on the newness, the presence, the nature of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do, to be priests. And you know, if you can put it on, what else can you do? 
you can take it off. You can put it on. You can take it off. Last week, we talked about living sacrifices. The thing about a living sacrifice is you can get up and walk away if you don't want to do it anymore, right? That's not good. It's not good to take off the righteousness of Christ because that's on purpose going in the opposite direction of what God wants. And we read, if you read Hebrews chapter 10, it says, that's scary ground to be on when we profane the sacrifice that Jesus made. And we're not him. He was tempted in every way that we are, but he didn't sin. But you know, the Bible says in Ephesians, there comes a time in our lives where sin is no longer our master. Come to us. We got to unbutton that shackle and throw it away. And if you can't do it, you call out to God because greater is he inside of you than he is in the world. Right? Anybody believe that this morning? Are you guys awake? Have I bored you to death? Have I totally just blown your minds to the point where you're sitting there going, can't take another thing, Pastor Ron. My head is full. We're only halfway done. (laughs) All right, the sash or the girdle represents readiness to act. Let me ask you, ladies, have you ever worn a really, really, really long dress? Any of you ladies ever been to a prom or the day you got married and you wore a really, 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 really long dress? Guys, I'm not going to ask you that because if you answer me, we're going to have to talk. <laughs> okay. I was listening to the guy on the radio yesterday when Terry and I were coming back from Morgantown. He's got a three-year school of manhood. No kidding. That's a deal in this world today. Teaching boys how to be men. Three-year school of manhood. So, those robes that they wore, I mean, if you've seen the movies, you saw the Ten Commandments, and you've seen the Jesus movie, and you've seen the Chosen, and all those things that are on TV now, they all wore long robes. You can't get very far very fast if you're running with stuff that's clear down to your feet, can you? So they wore a sash, and what they would do is if they needed to be in a hurry, they would just grab the back and pull it up through the front and tuck it under their belt so they could run, and it would be like culottes, ladies. Right? And they would take off running if they needed to run. And it was about being ready. And what does Paul tell Timothy? He tells Timothy to be ready in season and out of season. Doesn't he? Be ready to talk about God, whether it's favorable or whether it's unfavorable. Be ready. And the first time we kind of sort of see this stuff is... It's used to tuck the flowing robes of the day when quick movements required. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, during the Passover, the first Passover, when God was delivering the plagues on Egypt, one right after another, right after another, right after another, and then the mother of all plagues comes, which is the Passover, which is where all the firstborn die. Okay? And what do we know about that? We know that God told the people to kill a lamb or a goat, to take the blood, and to take a swab and swab it up the doorpost and across the lintel of the door and down the doorpost and don't come out the door until it's over. Right? Anybody remember that story? Passover, that's where Passover comes from. And if you remember, Jesus was crucified during the Passover. So his blood covers our sins. God gave a way for them to escape was through the blood that was put on the doorpost or the blood of the sacrifice that Aaron and his family offered. Now we have Christ. We don't have to do that anymore. And so as we look at this, God said, eat what you got, eat everything you have, have everything packed because the minute this is over, you're going to go. So be ready. And the only way you could be ready would be to have your your robes tucked down in your girdle, your, your sash, so that you'd be ready to take off. Okay? And... If we look at this, Jesus warned the disciples to be ready for his return, didn't he? Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 36. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 36. It says, be dressed for service. And keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from a wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. What's he say right there? Be dressed and ready for service. Do you hear that? Be dressed and ready. 
How many of us, when we believe that God wants us to do something or God's impressing on us to do something, we're in the middle of something else and we kind of want to not stop what we're doing, that we want to finish what we're doing before we go do what God wants us to do? Anybody? Yeah, we do. And so as we think about that, if we're going to be ready, that means when God gives you a divine appointment for the day, when God sends somebody into your life that you're supposed to talk to, you got to drop everything else you're doing and talk to them. When you read something in the Scripture and it's a command for you to participate in, what ought you to do? What's Nike say? Just do it. Right? Do it. But that's not convenient. Well, let me ask you this. Is serving God ever really convenient? Hmm? Anybody? Is serving God ever really convenient? What's that? Not on worldly terms, it's not. God's timing, though, is not our timing, is it? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, right? My all, everything, demands. What does a demand usually mean? When somebody demands something, what are they expecting? Immediate compliance, right? Immediate compliance. But we don't do anything immediately in our world today. Everything takes time. The turban that was on Aaron's head and on his son's head represents reverence before God. If you've ever met a Jewish man in the world today, whether they be a secular Jew or whether they be an Orthodox Jew, what is always going on on their head? They either have a hat on or what are the... Does anybody know what that little round thing they wear on the back of their head is called? A yarmulke, okay? They're either wearing a yarmulke or they're wearing a hat out of reverence for God. Now, we know that the Bible tells us that God has given us a helmet of salvation. How often are we supposed to wear that? How often are we supposed to wear the helmet of salvation? All day, every day, right? Because that's our understanding. That's our understanding of who God is and what he's done for us. And if we set the helmet of salvation aside, we begin to believe that we're okay. We begin to believe that we're doing what we're doing, and God's just blessing it because he, he's okay with what we're doing. But we need that helmet of salvation just like the turban. And you'll find that in Ephesians chapter 6. They also got underwear. Underwear. If you ever meet a Mormon that's planning to be God, he's got special underwear on. Because that's what the LDS church teaches. That men who are raised LDS, who go through the 12 steps of salvation, who go through the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Aaron, they get special linen underwear to wear that have tassels on them. And the only way you get them is to go through all those 12 steps of salvation and then you get married in the tabernacle the mormon tabernacle and you get married to a woman who's going to pump spiritual babies out for you for all of eternity while you're putting on your own planet so if anybody comes up to you and says i'm an lds i'm a latter-day saint or i'm of the church of jesus christ now is what they're calling themselves they are not believers in this book right here okay i don't have special underwear on except on sunday i wear my holy ones I have to keep getting them back out of the trash because Terry keeps throwing my t-shirts away that have holes in them. She throws my underwear away. That, they still got life in them. I just wear my holy ones, right? So you never know what day I'm wearing my holy underwear. So I might be more righteous that day. That's about how smart those people are. It's about how silly it is, isn't it? But here's the deal. The altar was always raised. So everybody could see. They didn't have these nice sanctuaries that are out there today where the guy's way down there on the platform and the seats go like this, up to the roof, kind of like in a football stadium. Where they were, everybody was on the ground and the guy was up high. And if he's wearing a robe and he's going up there and he ain't got any underwear on, chances are you might see something you're not supposed to see. And what was the first thing God did when man sinned? He covered his nakedness, right? He covered his nakedness. And so as we look at this, it sounds funny and it sounds silly. But God knows what you look like naked, physically and spiritually. Do you hear that? You can't 
hide anything from God. Nothing. He knows who you are. He made you. He created you. He knitted you together. He knows who you are. And he knows that we need to be covered everywhere by his righteousness. Don't we? Anybody believe that? So let's turn to Exodus chapter 28, verses 42 to 43 real quick. Exodus chapter 28. Just a couple pages over. Exodus 28. And we're going to read 42 to 44. And this is, God's, this is God's absolute instructions for Moses when he's making these underwear. Also make linen undergarments for them to be worn next to their bodies, reaching from their hips to their thighs. These must be worn whenever Aaron and his sons enter the tabernacle or approach the altar in the holy place to perform their priestly duties. Then they will not incur guilt and die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and all his descendants after him. Do you know what that tells me right there? That God is meticulous about every detail of what it looks like to worship him. Do you hear me? God demands what he demands for people to be able to worship him. And if we're going to be New Testament priests of believers, believer priests, we need to make sure that when we approach God, we're ready to be in his presence. That's why every Sunday before we start church at Cumberland Community Church, we pray and ask God to cleanse us, to, re to reveal to us anything that needs to be cleansed so that we don't cause his word not to be able to be heard by somebody. We did that this morning before you ever got here. You can ask the ladies on the worship team. We do. We pray that God would cleanse us so that nothing that we're doing would cause you not to hear what God's Word says. And do you know what? The Bible also says that all of us ought to examine ourselves lest we quench the Holy Spirit working in those around us. Does that make sense? Which means if you're going to approach God, you've got to approach a holy God, pure and washed and forgiven. That's why nobody who is not a believer in Jesus Christ can ever worship God. If people haven't had their sins forgiven, they cannot approach God, they cannot worship God. They might sing the songs and they might like the tune and they might be able to clap and keep time better than you guys do. But without the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ washing away their sins, they can have no entree into God's presence. But listen to this. When we're washed in the blood of Christ, when our sins are forgiven, when God has taken our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says we can approach God boldly. We can come right into his throne room with confidence, believing that we're his children. Isn't that an amazing thing that the God of the universe would do that for us? Isn't that amazing? Now, Nobody needs a scoreboard to know that we sin, right? There are some people, though, that believe if I do enough good things over here and I only do a couple bad things over here once in a while, then my good is going to outweigh my bad and God's going to be okay with that and he's going to let me in. The answer to that is he's not. He's not. Jesus is the only way. He's the once for all sacrifice that washes away the sins of the world and he's the one who determines by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. And if we're going to be priests of God, we have to come in through Him. If we're going to be holy and pure before God, we've got to come in before Him. And that's what this, these undergarments represent, renouncing the self or the flesh. We have to do away with the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. You know, those are the three things we deal with the most. Lust of sight, lust of the flesh, pride of life, right? And we need to do away with that. And by letting God clothe us, we do that. We're reminded that we can't please God by operating in our own fleshly nature. Does anybody believe that? You know, that's not my opinion. So let's turn, if you would, with me to, well, Romans 8, I'll read it to you. Those who are under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. That is Romans 8.8. 8. Those who are under control of their sinful nature can never please God. So how often can they please God? Never. Never. Well, what's it look like when we're under the control of our sin nature? Turn to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll be finished. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 
we're going to look at verses 16 through 21. Galatians 5, 16 through 21. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Hmm. Where do all of our cravings that are opposite of God, what God wants come from? What's it say right there? Where do all those cravings that are opposite of what God wants come from? Our sinful nature, right? The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Holy Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses, right? Because what did God say? God said there's coming a day when I'm going to write my commandments on the hearts of those who belong to me. They won't need stone tablets anymore. It'll be written on their hearts. And Jesus said when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict us of what is righteous and what is not righteous, right? He would help us to understand. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So therefore, Romans 8.8 8 just doubles down on that. It says anybody who's living under the influence of their sinful nature can never, ever please God. Well, Pastor Ron, how do we fix that? What do we do? We put on the nature of Christ. We put on the righteousness of Christ. We take off our old sin nature. You see, spiritual priests must surrender to the life-giving power and the strength given by the Holy Spirit. We need to quit trying to do our best. We need to quit trying to do better. God doesn't care if you're better. He cares if you're holy. God doesn't care if you got it right this time. He wants you to get it right every time. And the only way that you can do that is by living by His Word, following Him, allowing Him to be the most important part of your life, always asking for forgiveness immediately, immediately when you do something wrong. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, and there's still stuff that falls out of my mouth and things that come through my mind that should never, ever be there. I'm going to tell you the truth. Remember what I said? My feet are on the same ground yours on. I don't walk above the ground. I'm not any holier than you are. I struggle too. But I have to ask God for his forgiveness. I have to. Because the longer you go without asking God forgiveness, the easier it is to keep falling further and further and further and further away from him. And that's not what anybody that's a part of the priesthood of believers wants. We want to be the ones that are used by God today. And you know, God can't use you today if you haven't come to him first today. Does that make sense to everybody? God can't use you first today if you're not confessed and prayed up and asking him to be the one that's the most important part of your life. Sometimes God works in spite of me. How about you? Sometimes God works in spite of me. Despite what I do, he still does what he does. But I don't want it to be that way. I want to be a vessel that God can use. I want to be somebody that God can use to help other people understand what it looks like to live for God. And yes, we have God's grace. But one of the things that's being preached in our world today is cheap, greasy grace. Which says, I can just do whatever I want to because God's just going to forgive me. I'm sorry. You got to ask for his forgiveness. Don't you? You sure do. And, you know, this last song that we're going to sing today is uh, all about the fact that God is so much greater than we are. Do you know that every heartbeat that you had while you were sitting in this room today was God's grace working in your life? Every breath that you've taken since the day you were born is God's gracious gift to you 
as a person? Do you know that the fact that one day, if you have, the day you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and become the most important part of your life, God's grace has been working around the clock. He was the one who got you there. He's the one who's keeping you there. And ultimately, he's the one who's going to deliver you to heaven. Do you hear that? It's not you. It's not on you. But we have a role in keeping ourselves where God wants us to be. We can't earn God's favor. We can't. What did we say? What did Isaiah 64, 6 say? All of our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. And then when we put on our self-righteous duds, have you ever been to that church where they all strut around like peacocks and they got their self-righteousness on and they're just looking to see how much better they are than you? Huh? That stinks to God. It does. It stinks to high heaven. What we have to do is humble ourselves before God. The Bible says if we humble ourselves, if we take the eye out, and we say, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. I've heard the words, greater are you that's in me than what's going on in the world. Make that real to me. Show me that you can use me. Help me to clean up my act by turning my sins over to you. I can't fix me. Only you can fix me. You're the only one who can make me part of this priesthood of believers. You're the only one who can take my sinful nature and move it off to the side and clothe me in your righteousness. Just you, God. I can't do that. But I have to be a part of that, don't I? Because God doesn't just do that, does he? Why? Because then we would really think we were something. Wouldn't we? If we just all of a sudden were better, we'd think we did it. But we didn't, and we can't. And God can. And if that list of things that we just read there out of Galatians chapter 5, those are all things that determine the definition of somebody's life. Not that they just do something once in a while, but that's what they're doing all the time. And they still want to tell you they're a Christian. The Bible says that we have every right in the world to confront them and say, that kind of fruit doesn't come from a godly person. How do you reconcile that with what God wants? Hmm? Do you know what that does? It causes confrontation. And what's the one thing we hate more than anything in the world? Huh? confrontation rather than having confrontation we'll go pout do we have any powders in the room hmm? they used to call it sulking pouters do we go pout i pout once in a while I'm not gonna lie we have other people who they've got a fuse about that long and all you got to do is get close with the fire and boom the whole world explodes that's uncontrolled rage Right? The Bible says we can't belong to Christ if we have uncontrolled rage in our lives. If you're a liar, quit lying. If you're a thief, quit stealing. All those kind of things that define us. But thank God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says some of you were once like that. 